morning, everyone. Now, just because I was looking that way, that doesn't mean I didn't want a good morning to you guys, too. Okay? So I, you might be seeing a lot of my right shoulder, but I'll try to get over and acknowledge that you guys are here. Okay? You know, um, I've often wondered, uh, I was not raised a Seventh-day Adventist, and I often puzzled with myself over some things that had to do with the Sabbath. And it always bothered me that, as we mentioned briefly last night, that the Seventh-day Adventists of the first century killed the greatest man who ever lived, cried, crucify him, crucify him, and then that Friday afternoon ran home to get their house cleaned to be ready for the Sabbath. I always was bothered by that, and I thought, there's something wrong here. The picture doesn't fit. And then I began to think about the fourth commandment, which, of course, we could all say it together. Uh, But, you know, it's that first line that, that really hits me hard, where it says, remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. You say, well, Bill, what's the big deal about that? Well, only somebody that is holy can keep something holy. Does that make sense? And my Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 7 that the carnal mind is at enmity with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And so I say, well, the carnal mind that I was given at birth as a gift from Adam, I can't do something that's holy. Can you? We can't do something that's holy. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7, 18, he said, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells what? No good thing." So how can somebody in their flesh, where nothing good dwells, how can they keep something holy? That's impossible. As Job 14.4 says, he said, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. So I'm looking at this and I'm saying, now, Lord, in the Ten Commandments, and especially in the fourth that contains your seal, which the devil has been assaulting for 6,000 years, saying that God has been unjust to demand something of his creatures that they cannot do, I sat and I stepped back and I said, Well, if God's calling me to keep the Sabbath holy and I can't do anything that is holy, was the devil right? Well, folk, then I began to think. And I thought about a statement in Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages, page 280 in the chapter on the Sabbath. It says, No other institution was committed to the Jews tended so fully to distinguish them from surrounding nations as did the Sabbath. God designed that its observance should designate them as his worshipers. It was to be a token of their separation from idolatry and their connection with the true God. And then Ellen White says this, But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. And again, we've already acknowledged that that's impossible. Because you can't produce righteousness, and I can't either. So the Sabbath then must be calling me to an experience far beyond a 24-hour period. 
It says, through faith, through faith, they must become partakers of the righteousness of, guess who? Of Christ. So God calls us to keep the Sabbath holy, but that can only be done through the one who is holy. And so we must be in submission to the one who is holy in order to keep the Sabbath holy. Does that make sense? Otherwise, it's impossible for us to keep the Sabbath holy. So the Sabbath is the highest form of, In the eyes of heaven, it's the highest form of our total self-renunciation and our total dependence upon Jesus Christ. And the Jews lost sight of that. The Jews thought, well, if we keep the Sabbath, then we are God's people and we're going to heaven. And so the Sabbath became their meal ticket to the kingdom, but they refused to submit themselves to Christ. Now, I remember years ago when I was in Red Bluff, California, and I was teaching a Sabbath school class, and uh, there was a lady in the class. I, yeah, I still remember her name, as a matter of fact. She was an older lady, she and her husband, and They had uh, basically built the church in Red Bluff. They were very heavy donors to the church. And one Sabbath, as I got up to give Sabbath school, she leaned down in her seat to tie her shoe. And my first comment in Sabbath school, I I said, if anybody here thinks that by coming through the doors this morning on the Sabbath that that is your meal ticket to the kingdom, I said, you better think again. Because the Sabbath did not save a single Seventh-day Adventist in the first century. Nor for the previous thousand years. All the way back to King Solomon and another 500 back to Moses. The Sabbath didn't save a single Seventh-day Adventist during all of those centuries. And I said, and it won't save one of us today. Well, folk, you know what? Somehow that statement helped that lady to forget about her shoe. And it was like somebody had set off a rocket and she just about jumped out of her pew. That was her idea. I came through the door this morning. It's Sabbath. I'm going to heaven. No, that wasn't true. It says, as the Jews, as the Seventh-day Adventists departed from God and failed to make the righteousness of Christ their own by faith, the Sabbath lost its significance to them. Now, Ellen White ties together two concepts there. Number one, that people must receive the righteousness of Jesus because they don't have any of their own. They must accept the righteousness of Christ by faith in order to live a life of righteousness. And because the ancient Adventists did not accept Christ's righteousness, why didn't they? Because they already had their own. They were Seventh-day Adventists. They paid tithe. They ate a certain diet. They believed in a sanctuary service. They at least gave lip service to a prophet. Sound familiar? All things pretty much like us, isn't it? We've got a lot of similarities between ancient Seventh-day Adventists and modern Seventh-day Adventists, isn't there? A lot of similarities. And it says that as the Jews departed from God 
and refused or failed to make the righteousness of Christ their own by faith, the Sabbath lost its significance to them. So if we are not trusting in the power of God to help us do right on a daily basis, then you know what? The significance of the Sabbath, we will lose that, friend. And then we will think, well, it's okay to get involved with the evangelicals and go to church on Sunday. Or it's okay to invite evangelicals into our church and to hear somebody from an apostate Protestant church come into our church and preach to us. Because we failed to understand our desperate need for purity that we don't possess. And if we don't recognize that need and receive that, on a daily basis, eventually we'll throw away the Sabbath too. So folk, the Sabbath demands, it doesn't demand just a 24-hour period, which sometimes is what we only focus on and say, well, I've, I've done no secular work from Friday night to Saturday night 24 hours, no secular work, Lord. That's only this much of the story. Because the Sabbath, again, is the sign that we recognize every day that we cannot produce righteousness. You say, but wait a minute, Bill. Wasn't it Ben Franklin or some pagan proverb that says, God helps those who help themselves? Folk, excuse my English, but that is a bunch of baloney. God does not help those who help themselves. The Jews helped themselves, didn't they? God helps those who realize they can't help themselves. As Jesus said in Mark chapter 2, he said, those that are whole don't need a physician. It's those that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So it's okay. It's okay to say, Lord, I'm nothing. I can't do any good thing, as Paul said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will to do, it's present with me, but how to do it, I don't know. So, folk, God is asking and praying and pleading with us today to recognize our desperate spiritual need. And for those who do recognize it, what can't the Lord do in a human life that admits their need for Him? What can't the Lord do? He can do everything. Even as Jude 24 says, now unto Him who is able to keep you from falling. Miracle of miracles. Lord, you can do that for me. I've failed. I've, my performance has been rotten. But you can do that for me. And folk, those two concepts are intimately tied to the seventh day Sabbath. Seventh day Sabbath. Let's take a look for just a little while. I see the time. I understand about trap doors and all that. You know, the book of Hebrews is wonderful. If there wasn't another book in the Bible that is, is just so full of so many beautiful truths, 
It's the book of Hebrews. Well, Hebrews chapter 4 does talk about the seventh day Sabbath and talks about it in the deepest spiritual terms. Hebrews 4, 1 to 3, Paul said, Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Notice the two concepts there. Faith in the power of Christ, believing that He can do for us what we can't do, is intimately related to entering into His Sabbath rest. As I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So Paul continues where he left off in Hebrews chapter 3, discussing God's rest and Israel's failure because of unbelief. I love that picture on the right side. Admitting your weaknesses does not diminish your strengths. It shows courage. It shows courage. Because of our utter inability to do works of righteousness, we must rest in the power of God to do for us what we cannot do. We must look to the Lord Our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. To do righteousness in our lives. Well, how could Jesus, who was pure, holy, harmless, undefiled, as the Bible says, who was the only one righteous, how could he give that to us? How could he understand our plight? Romans 8, 3 and 4, the Bible says, For what the law could not do, nobody had ever perfectly obeyed the law of God. It was weak through the flesh, from Adam all the way down to Jesus' first coming. No human being had ever perfectly obeyed the law. The Bible says in Romans 3, For all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So the Bible says that God sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. When Jesus came, folk, in the likeness of sinful flesh, Hebrews chapter 2 says... For verily he took not upon him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. So when Christ came to this earth, he took upon himself a nature just like you, just like me. He took upon himself a carnal, sinful nature. And the Bible says, but he did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. 1 Peter chapter 2. So Christ came in our flesh, took upon himself the seed of Abraham, stepped to the lowest place by taking upon himself our nature. Now why did Jesus take upon himself our nature? Why did he do that? He did that so that He could show us that through dependence upon Him, humanity could obey the Ten Commandments. That's why Jesus came. So often we hear, well, Jesus came to die. Yeah, but that was secondary. First off, He came to live and to show us how through faith in His power, We can live too. Folk, if Jesus had not touched us right where we are, He could not be our example. He could not give us courage today. 
to know that we could be lifted up from sin and degradation too. But Christ stepped all the way down and touched our nature by dwelling in that very same nature. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for a wonderful Savior who knows exactly what we are experiencing. As Hebrews chapter 4 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Folk, the Lord knows and He understands our struggles. He knows our challenges. He knows our weaknesses. He knows the, the clamorings of, the car, of our flesh. He knows all that. Because He went through it on our behalf. And Christ was victorious in our flesh. Now why? Romans 8 verse 4 says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Folks, the message of Paul and to the, to the church at Rome is the exact same message of John the Revelator in Revelation 14. John the Revelator said, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It's the same thing as Romans 8 and verse 4. So Jesus stepped down from the throne of the universe that he might meet us right where we are and lift us. Lift us to a place where we can walk in harmony with God's law through faith in his power. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This was the same message that was given to Abram. The gospel was preached in the Old Testament. Abram knew the gospel. Galatians 3 says that the gospel was preached to Abram when he was told that through his offspring, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. The Messiah of the world would come through the seed of Abraham. And through that offspring, through the Messiah, all the world would be blessed. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 4, 4-7, He spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. God did rest from the seventh day from all His works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into My rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David today, after so long a time as it, as it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. The presence of Christ at Mount Sinai made that mountain holy, just as his presence in the Sabbath makes that holy. Just so the presence of Christ in the individual makes Him holy. The Sabbath was designed as a constant reminder of the work of God through Christ in redemption. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. We're commanded, be ye holy, for I am holy. But we cannot make ourselves holy. There's, only, there's one thing that always makes holy, and that is the presence of Jesus Christ. When Christ dwells in our hearts by faith, we're made holy by His presence. And this is the blessing of Sabbath keeping. That is Christian experience. That is the Christian life. When Christ dwells in the heart by faith, by His presence, He makes the believer holy. God's law is not unjust. As Romans 7 says, the commandment is holy, it's just, and it's good. God didn't send His Son to do away with law. He sent His Son to elevate humanity 
to rise up to obey law. If physical rest is the only idea of the Sabbath, man can rest on one day just as well as another. He can can do more. He can divide up his rest during the several days of the week. He can rest three or four hours each day as may suit him. He may rest rainy days and work sunshiny days if he pleases. If physical rest is the only idea of the Sabbath, Let it be understood that merely refraining from work is not God's idea of Sabbath keeping. It may be Sunday keeping. It may be Saturday keeping. It may be Friday keeping. It may be Monday keeping. But it's not Sabbath keeping. It's not Sabbath keeping because the idea of Sabbath is spiritual rest. You know what the hardest day of the week is for me? Sabbath. It's the hardest day of the week. That's the day I work harder than any other. Because church members, they they want to talk, they want to ask me questions, they, you know, they they want my absolute undivided attention. And that's stressful. Giving sermons, I love doing it, but it involves stress. It's work. When I go home after church on Sabbath. I just collapse. I'm exhausted. Sabbath is not physically restful for me. But as this quote is saying, Sabbath rest is not just about physical rest. It's about spiritual rest depending on the one who is holy to make me holy. It will therefore be seen at once that all theories of Sabbath keeping which rest upon the idea of physical recuperation are good for nothing. Man can enforce abstinence from labor, but he cannot enforce Sabbath keeping. A man may be forced to refrain from physical work. He may be kept in idleness, but no one can enforce Sabbath keeping. It is a spiritual thing entirely. It is true that in genuine Sabbath keeping... There will be an entire secession from unnecessary physical work, but that is not in itself Sabbath keeping. The reason we cease from labor on the seventh day is that we may be at liberty to contemplate God as manifest to us in Jesus Christ. You know, folk, as as Paul in Hebrews 4 talks about the Sabbath and God resting in creation. In creation, there was nothingness. The Bible says the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. So the earth was nothingness. What made it beautiful? What made it something glorious? The Bible says that By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. So the word of God created this beautiful planet, this beautiful world from nothingness. And then at the end of the six days, God rested. Because he was tired? No. To be an example for us. To stand back and say, if that's what God could do in creation, can't He come into a darkened mind, an unholy heart, and can't He do something beautiful in my life? And that's what the Sabbath is all about. The resting from physical labor is an outward sign of the fact that we have ceased, we have ceased from sin. For we which have believed do enter into rest, and he that has entered into God's rest, he has also ceased from his own works as God did from his. 
Now, somebody may say, oh, but wait a minute, how about James 2? James 2 says that we've got to work, that faith without works is dead. Well, folk, do you know what the greatest work you and I have to perform in our relationship to the Lord? is getting out of the way and letting Him work. That's what we've got to do. You know, folk will often say to me, they'll say, so how, how's, your, how's your ministry going? And I will very honestly say to them, it's going beautifully as long as I stay out of the way. <laughs> and I mean that with all my heart. It's when I get in and think that Bill Hughes is the one that's doing this, that's when it falls apart. But when I get out of the way and say, Lord, this is your work, these are your messages, now you guide me to do your work. Everything goes beautifully. Beautifully. So God wants us to enter His rest and to cease trusting in our own strength to do what we can't do anyway. <clears throat> what we can't do anyway. If Jesus had given them rest, then would He not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For He that is entered into His rest he has also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Now let's wrap our minds around this. Let us labor therefore, let us work therefore to enter into that rest. Now how do you do that? How do you labor? How do you work to rest? Well, again, my greatest work, my, my greatest struggle is letting God do it. Because I want to do it myself. I want to get in the way. I want to think that I'm somehow important. Boy, what a self-deception that is. But if I will commit myself and continue to choose to put my will on the side of the Lord then I'm laboring to enter His rest. His rest, not mine. We've learned that the Sabbath is a spiritual rest. It is therefore impossible for one to keep the Sabbath unless Christ, whose presence gives rest, dwells in his heart by faith. Every case of conversion is, is a display of the creative power of God calling out of darkness to light, delivering from the power of darkness, translating us to the kingdom of His dear Son. The true Sabbath is assigned to every Christian of the creative power that has, through, has thus wrought for His deliverance, and which is to uphold Him through all His varied experiences as He journeys toward the eternal kingdom. As the Israelites were enabled to keep the Sabbath after they were brought out of Egypt, so the Christian who has been delivered from the bondage of sin, can enjoy spiritual rest, which is true Sabbath keeping. Sabbath rest is therefore allowing Jesus to do in us what we cannot do for ourselves. Our labor is to depend upon Christ and to deny our nature, to deny the old man of sin, we so much want to do things in our strength, our way. The Sabbath calls us to depend upon Jesus and let Him produce righteousness in us, which we can't do anyway. Can't do it. Word makes the proud humble, the perverse meek and contrite, the disobedient obedient. Sinful habits natural to man are interwoven with the daily practice. But the Word, the Word alone cuts away fleshly lusts. 
It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the mind. It divides the joints and marrow, cutting away the lusts of the flesh, making men willing to suffer for their Lord. Manuscript 42, 1901. Finally, as we close Hebrews chapter 4, the Apostle Paul said, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Folk, the Sabbath tied to our great high priest in the sanctuary above tells us to find rest, to find forgiveness, which every single one of us needs. There isn't somebody in this room that's immune to that need because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all done that. And so Paul says, go to the throne of grace. Find mercy. Find that forgiveness that you can't get anywhere else. No church can bring that forgiveness. No work of ours can bring us forgiveness but we can go to Jesus and he will wrap us he will embrace us in his arms and say you are my child and I love you and then folk he says to rest in his power which is grace power to do for us what we can't do and within those gifts of our merciful high priest we see the very essence of the Seventh-day Sabbath, resting in what Christ can do for us and in us each and every day. God bless you.